hey, how you doing? You have garden problems, I have garden problems. Well, I have lots of problems, but we're just gonna talk about the garden ones today, right? <laughs> Um, in my last video series I did with Aaron from The Impatient Gardener, we talked about some garden, let's call them challenges I've had this year, and then she was offering solutions. And then in this follow-up series we're doing now, which is sponsored by Troy Belt, we're calling it Fence Talks. I thought that was a pretty good name. You know, it's kind of like people to people, oh, I can do that, um, solving each other's problems, and I love that kind of thing. So today we're going to find out what worked, what didn't, and I got a little surprise for you. Ready? Let's go. So another one of the problems that Eric told me about that he knows is, was going to develop, but you know, hadn't happened yet because it wasn't time yet, was cabbage lopers, um, which are these you know caterpillars that will go in and eat your cabbage and really make a mess of it. Now, I offered the suggestion of covering it from the get-go, which will solve that problem, or hand picking them. But you know, when they get on there, they really get going, and it can be hard to keep up with that. And sometimes you'll see their frass before you actually see any sign of the caterpillars. So. My recommendation, if you guys are dealing with that at this point, you might want to think about stepping it up if you can't keep track of them and keep a handle on it and you weren't able to cover your cabbage early on, is think about using something called BT. That is an organic solution. You just make sure that you mix it up um, if it's not a ready to spray option, which is also available according to the package directions. And then when you do spray it, make sure you spray it in the evening after all the pollinators are gone. It'll be fine by morning when the pollinators are back out, but you don't want that. You don't want a pollinator to come in direct contact with that. But BT takes care of caterpillar type bugs. So that's something that could help you at this point if you're still seeing problems. But that doesn't mean that bugs are gone in people's gardens. In fact, I know a lot of people have been telling me and I've been experiencing a lot that there are a lot of bugs around. And, and this right here is a sign of one of the worst ones. This is my really disgusting jar of uh, Japanese beetles that I've been collecting. Now, most people know what Japanese beetles are. They are not, I don't think they're too bad in the western part of the country, um, but certainly on the eastern half of the country, they're a real issue. And they will come in and they eat so many plants and they can cause really serious damage. So there isn't a lot you can do safely with Japanese beetles once the adults are around. Um, but one of the things you can do, which is what I do, is collect them in a jar with soapy water. And um, then once they're dead in there, you can just pour it out because um, it does get pretty rancid in there. So that's one way to deal with Japanese beetles. Now, you can apply something called milky spore to your lawn because you will be working on killing the grubs then. But that's something you do in spring and that doesn't help you at this point in their life stage. Um, and one thing that people ask me about all the time is Japanese beetle traps. And I will just say that you need to be very careful with Japanese beetle traps. Um, people feel pretty strongly about them, but they are proven to attract more Japanese beetles than you already had. So you really don't want to use them if you live on a small property. And if you do decide to use them, you want to put them way as far away as you can from your plants because you want to draw them away from your plants that they might attack. I see a lot of people showing how many Japanese beetles they collect, but that's not how many Japanese beetles would have been there if they hadn't put the trap out. So, so it works for some people, doesn't work for others, but it certainly is an organic method to manage Japanese beetles. So that is the bug that's really on, been on my mind lately. But Eric, I want to know, have the cabbage lopers showed up? Did you deal with it? What's happening? How's your crop looking? Boo! That was pretty bad, wasn't it? Okay. Yeah, Aaron, this stuff works. This is floating, generically called floating row cover. It's really, really lightweight. Um, and yeah, I put it over the plants. No more uh, caterpillars. So yeah, it worked. No, well here, let me just show you. No bugs, no holes. And the fabric was really simple. I just had, some, well, I took the wire things down, but I just used some wire hoops across here and laid it across. And then when I saw those butterflies, they were all around, but they didn't get to this, so. But now, Aaron, I have a slightly larger problem. It's about 14 pounds, and it's black and furry. Somebody decided that they like kale. Yeah, that's a problem. Do you like kale? 
Is kale your favorite? I don't know. Get it. Get the kale. There you go. Good girl. <laughs> Japanese beetles. Welcome to my world. So this is, well, it's kind of a hot mess. I'm, it's, it's, it's not even a garden. It's just part of the yard. And there's a bunch of raspberries and wild grapevines in here, which are a magnet for Japanese beetles. And I've learned over time to not put out those scent traps because I have a small yard. And all I did was just invite more Japanese beetles in. So I have a solution much like Aaron. I call it, use what you got. And what I have, what I got, are a bunch of coffee cups. And I hate just using a one-off coffee cup. I try not to, but I have a collection of them for painting or whatever. But soapy water, bugs are in there. And boom, you're done. Okay, no more of that uh, scent trap thing. That's bad. So now I feel like it's a hallmark of these videos that we just have to like lay down on the ground. So here I am up close and personal with the area that we talked about because if you recall, Eric had mentioned that he was having a problem with grass growing into his raised beds and I said, I had the same problem with grass creeping under my fence into the edge of my vegetable garden over here. And so sure enough, I have gone back, I've pulled out those weeds and I've come back with a nice thick layer of wood chip mulch here, which should take care of this problem and prevent more weeds for a long time. So the question is, Eric, did you get your chipper shredder put into action and take care of that problem around your raised beds? <laughs> Oh man, it's hard to get down on the ground like this sometimes. So this has been a very cathartic project for me. So we've gone from this where I, I have grass coming up along the sides, grass growing into my beds, to this. No more grass in my beds and also no more grass between the beds so I don't have to mow it either. I mean, you can zoom around the outsides of the beds with your mower and then you don't have to stop and think, oh, I gotta get my way between the beds because we use this. So let me just kind of show you, this is the grassy weed stuff that I had between the beds. And then as I chip up stuff, I lay down this thick cardboard. That's just shipping cardboard from various containers I've gotten. This goes down, oh, look at that, see, worm castings. Look at those worm castings in there. That is a great sign, oh, and a cricket. But anyway, I put down thick cardboard and then I lay down wood chips on top of that. How cool is that? You knew I was gonna pull the sign out again, didn't you? So, but yeah, we. this is the chips from the trees that I cut back to get rid of the moss in my yard. I've chipped it up with the Great Chipper Shredder, which is the most cathartic experience in the world. I don't know, there's just something about taking trees and making really cool wood chip mulch out of them. And then you're laying it between your beds. So it's keeping the weeds down. It's creating a giant worm farm, I discovered. And I'm very happy. Thank you, Aaron. So you might recall that Eric had a very interesting problem with his compost, which was that a bear got into it. And I can't say that I've ever had that happen here, but the solution for whether bears are getting into your compost or other sort of varmints are getting in there is pretty much the same. And that's either don't put kitchen scraps in if that becomes a huge problem, or bury them deeply in your brown layer so that that scent isn't there and it's not laying right out on top like a big buffet for whatever critter walks by. Now, one of the issues in the compost pile, at least for me at this time of year, is often that I have way more greens than I have browns. And um, the solution to that, like is the solution for many things here, is leaves. Now, what I did is I saved some chopped up leaves uh, last winter because or last fall because I had more than I could possibly use and I just put them in some old um, some old uh, potting soil bags and um, Actually, they break down and these are really quite broken down already. They break down into these just lovely um, This is basically compost right here But this is a great addition to the compost at this time if you can save a few leaves to put in there now I ne a leaf never goes to waste in this yard. I use them as 
mulch. I use them in the compost. Leaves have so many uses in the garden, so I never, ever, ever throw them away. Um, but that's a great use for leaves in your garden. If you're looking for something to do and you've got some extra leaves, um, use them to add them to your compost pile, especially at this time of year when it's pretty much all green stuff growing in your compost. You can balance that out with some leaves to get some more browns in there so that you get that compost working good. So Eric, any more bear problems in the compost? So what I first did here was I opened it up and then this is just kind of hasn't been turned in a long time. So I just wanted to work on this, turning it. Uh, there's the eggshells, there's the problem. And I'm much more aware to, I think this is the attractant. It's about the only thing I can think of are eggshells. So I'm burying these deep in here instead of just dumping them on the top now. I bury this wet, well, that's kind of not deep enough, but I go in and then I cover it. This is my shredded leaf pile. I used the chipper shredder to shred up all these leaves last fall. Nice stuff. And that has seemed to work. But we have another problem with a four-legged furry animal. The bear tore apart my maple syrup shed. So you thought that Andy was going to pop out of the shed and go, ah, oh, ha, ha, you know, Andy got into the shed. No, the bear has moved from my compost pile to my maple syrup shed. And I'm pretty sure I know why he or she tore. I mean, it's kind of a beat up shed anyway, but it's my shed. These are old frames from uh, one of my beehives. And bees don't, I mean, bears don't go after honey. They're looking for protein. And they're, oh, here's my um, other troublemaker here. They smell the honeycomb and they tear open your shed. So the problem is, Andy, don't eat that. I was keeping these because they burn, they start fires really well. This is old wood with beeswax on it. Put a light to that, a light, what's that called, a match? So this burns really well when you're in the middle of winter and you want to start up your evaporator. Um, so lesson learned, I can't keep these frames in my maple syrup shed because it becomes a bear shed. So compost has been improved. Now I got to improve on the maple syrup slash bear shed. All right, those were three of my challenges and three solutions for them. <gasps> over on Aaron's channel, there should be a video floating right over here. We're going to have the next three challenges and whether it worked out or not. Plus <gasps> our special guest star. <gasps> who is exhausted. So I'll see you in the next one there. If it's not right there, it'd be floating in the text below. I guess she's done with us. I'll see you in the next one. Right, Henry? <laughs>